Good morning and welcome to the Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing and public meeting of today, March 19th, 2024. And we'll begin by taking attendance. I'll ask our general counsel, Mark Silverman, to call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Commissioner Bland. Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Chen. Yeah. Commissioner Chu. Commissioner Ginsburg. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Yeah. Here. 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 All right. Good morning again, and welcome to our public hearing and public meeting of March 19th. This meeting is being held in our hearing room at 1 Center Street on the ninth floor. It is also being held via Zoom and uh, live streamed on our YouTube channel for people who would like to watch it remotely. Um, we have a full agenda today. We are going to begin with our um, a public meeting agenda with a recent uh, item from our research department, which is a proposal to calendar a new uh, site for consideration. And then we will move to our public hearing, uh, our uh, public meeting agenda for applications for work on designated properties that have already had a public hearing. And finally, we'll move to our public hearing agenda to review new applications for work on designated properties. And with that, I will turn it over to Caitlin Musnikal, our director of research. Thank you, Sarah. Item number one this morning is LP 2682, Frederick Douglass Memorial Park at 3201 Amboy Road in Staten Island, Block 4475, Lot 300. Item proposed for the commission's calendar is a 14.88 acre cemetery designed by J. Wallace Higgins and built in 1935. And commissioners, this site was identified as part of our work throughout the city to identify sites with significant African-American history. And the president and officers of the board of trustees are here today and are very supportive of this designation. Presenting this morning is Marianne Hurley. Thank you. Good morning. Frederick Douglass Memorial Park is a non-sectarian cemetery at 3201 Amboy Road in Staten Island. It was founded in 1933 as a place where African Americans could be assured of a peaceful and dignified place to bury and honor their loved ones. And this was at a time when discrimination and segregation meant that they were often excluded from other burial sites. Get closer. Okay, sorry. With its park-like, is that better? With its park-like grounds designed by J. Wallace Higgins, the historically and culturally significant Memorial Park has continued to serve the community with the same mission for almost a century. The proposed individual landmark is a nearly 15 acre lot in the Oakwood Heights neighborhood of Staten Island. It is adjacent to the larger Ocean View Cemetery and late 20th century housing tracts. The main entrance is at the northeast corner at the intersection of Montreal Avenue and Amboy Road. The park was founded in 1933 by Rodney Dave. He was a Harlem funeral director who experienced firsthand the inequities African Americans experienced at many cemeteries. The deceased were buried in the least desirable plots, often separated from the rest of the cemetery. Visiting families and funeral processions were often relegated to the side gates rather than the main entrance. He wanted to provide fitting burial sites for African Americans at a time when this kind of discrimination was common. Dave enlisted the supportive professionals who shared the vision. He partnered with Benjamin Diamond, a successful businessman, and Frederick Bunn, an attorney who had developed nearby Ocean View Cemetery. The first 12 member board of directors included prominent Harlem citizens, including fellow funeral directors and ministers. A newspaper article noted that the first governing board consisted of, quote, public spirited men who sensed the growing need of just such a development, unquote. 
One of the first directors, in fact, was the highly influential Adam Clayton Powell Sr., pastor of the well-known Abyssinian Baptist Church. Because of its large areas of undeveloped land, Staten Island was an attractive location to create a cemetery. The founders acquired land from adjacent cemeteries that were located between Amboy Road and Arthur Kill Road. They then commissioned James Wallace Higgins, a New Jersey civil engineer and landscape architect, to design the Memorial Park. This 1935 map shows Frederick Douglass Memorial Park at the upper right. It is adjacent to the United Hebrew Cemetery at the upper left and to Ocean View Cemetery shown along, along the lower half of the map. The landscape plan of the Memorial Park shows a design that Higgins created with wide curving pathways along the outer edges with axial paths connecting to circular features. From the beginning, the park reserved a place for a memorial to Frederick Douglass to be placed within the circle closest to the entrance at the upper right-hand corner. The new Memorial Park was to be a cemetery that continued the vision and inspiration of Frederick Douglass. For centuries, the history of New York City's burial grounds for Africans and African Americans was a record of degrading discrimination. Burials were either separate from the mainline cemetery or restricted to the fringes and the least desirable locations. This occurred in both public and early homestead cemeteries. Several New York City landmarks illustrate this. Labeled on the 1770, 1755 map as the, quote, Negro's burial grounds, unquote, a significant African burial ground was located outside the city's colonial boundary. It had been forgotten and built upon for years. The area is now within the African Burial Ground and Commons Historic District, a 1993 New York City landmark and a couple blocks across the street. Another example is the Joseph Rodman Drake Park and Enslaved People's Burial Ground. This is a homestead cemetery with unmarked burial plots in a separate section for enslaved people. Located in the Bronx, it was recently designated a landmark in December of 2023. These and many other examples illustrate this historic overarching disregard for African and African-American burial sites. <laughs> the history of burial sites also includes those established by free black communities, such as the one in Seneca Village in Manhattan, and the Rossville AME Zion Cemetery in Sandy Ground, Staten Island. <clears throat> Seneca Village, originally between 82nd and 88th Street, was settled by free African Americans and Irish immigrants from 1825 to 1857. An African American's church's cemetery, along with all of Seneca Village's buildings, were raised for the construction of Central Park today a New York City scenic landmark. The extant Rossville AME Zion Church Cemetery, designated as, as a city landmark in 1985, is one for African Americans where the markers range from the 1860s to the late 20th century. It is one of the significant sandy ground properties associated with the free black oyster men and their families who settled there in the mid 19th century. In addition to Rossville, there are at least two other Staten Island examples of African American cemeteries, but these are no longer used. They are located toward the north end of the island. One is the very early fountain burial ground, active from 1750 to 1820. It's now an empty lot next to the railroad tracks along Old Town Road. The second example is the cemetery once associated with the African AME Zion Church from 1880 to 1920 on Forest Avenue, 
It is now beneath a shopping mall. In the 1930s, at the time the Memorial Park was developed, African Americans experienced discrimination in where they could be buried and even what entrances to certain cemeteries they were able to use. The Frederick Douglass Memorial Park opened with its first burials June 10, 1935. It incorporated the latest engineering and landscape design features, such as park-like setting with extensive watering and, and, and drainage systems. The cemetery also included perpetual care provisions for the future maintenance of the burial site. As a convenience to the neighborhood, the administrative offices were located on 125th Street in Harlem. This cemetery was created for all African Americans. Those who are buried here reflect the history and culture of New York City's Black communities, including family stories, some of which include enslavement, migration, and hardships, but more often memorializes the everyday stories of past generations. The idea of a 20th century memorial park emphasizes the beauty of the countryside and the inspiration of nature, featuring meandering walkways and mature trees. Most of the stone markers are laid flat on the ground to highlight the overall park-like setting and peaceful environment. The monument to its namesake, Frederick Douglass, the 19th century abolitionist orator, writer, and activist was dedicated in 1961. The relief was designed by Angus McDougall, who died in 1978. His specialty was sculpting portrait heads. He was also a well-respected teacher and prominent designer for the Steuben Glass Company. The stone monument itself was designed and fabricated by Wegener Monuments still located nearby on Amboy Road. In addition to the many hundreds who have been buried at the cemetery since 1935, there are several notable celebrities. The jazz singer Mamie Smith, who died in 1946, became queen of the blues. The inscription on her monument that was placed in 2014 reads, by recording Crazy Blues in 1920, she introduced America to vocal blues and opened the recording industry to thousands of her American brothers and sisters. As such, she's regarded as a pioneer who paved the way for others during the Harlem Renaissance. Also notable is Tommy Ladmere, an accomplished jazz trumpeter during the 20s and 30s. He's considered by many as another blues king and second only to Louis Armstrong. Originally from New Orleans, Ladmere performed locally, most often in Harlem, but also toured Europe with band leaders Sam Whitting and Noble Sissel. Saul White, who died in 1955, is also known as King Solomon White, today considered one of the founding fathers of black baseball a pioneer who it is said paved the way for Jackie Robinson. He was not only a professional baseball player on white and black teams, but was also a historian who wrote the history of colored baseball in 1907. He was inducted into the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame posthumously in 2006, when his life as a professional ball player was commemorated. The cemetery office building is located along the northern edge of the property and access through a service entrance. As noted in a booklet produced for the dedication of the Douglas Memorial in 1961, the architect associated with the building is James Whitford, who died in 1947. He was a local Staten Island designer whose 50 year career was responsible for more than 2000 residential and commercial buildings. Despite alterations to the 
office building, and a replacement front entrance gate, the Memorial Park exhibits integrity of design and materials. With its original acreage, pathways, and now mature landscaping in place, In closing, the, federal, the Frederick Douglass Memorial Park on Staten Island is a historically significant cemetery established for African Americans. Since 1935, it has provided a dignified park-like resting place and as such is rich, rich with African American history. The cemetery celebrates black heritage, not only with its association with people who were part of the Harlem Renaissance, Renaissance, but also, and more importantly, honors generations of everyday African Americans who were afforded the respect they deserved. As such, it occupies a special place in the part, in part of the city's social and cultural history. Because of its historical significance, the research department recommends that the commission pension calendar the Frederick Douglass Memorial Park for consideration as an individual landmark. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Commissioners, do we have questions? Yes, yes. Commissioner Mark, Jefferson. The, the, red, the red mark, um, why the separation? Uh, it's a, a um, do you want to describe the property line? Sure, yeah, the, the line shown on this map is the property line of this cemetery. Okay, so okay, it, cemetery. Yeah. Thank you. It, it was once larger and uh, this is the current property and it does abut parkland. Oh, thank you. It's the full lot. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Ginsburg. Uh, this is just more of a question. Since it's still operating and I presume people are still being buried there, presuming we designate it, we'll, how will future burials, gravestones be reviewed or will they not be reviewed or is there a master plan? Um, we would um, uh, um, most certainly issue a certificate of no effect for any burial and any decision about any kind of memorial. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, certainly also recognize that there are other layers of regulation that are in, uh, that are placed on the site for new burials and would not impede those at all. All right, other, yes. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's really an interesting selection, not only culturally and historically, but aesthetically. I mean, the way they have it planted and the, the subtlety of it, it's really quite beautiful. It is, it is. It's both, um, you really can experience it through the design of the landscape as well. It's part and parcel of the experience. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, speaking of others, does the research department know how many other sites are like these that we are exploring? We did a lot of look in terms of what we've designated. Um, and this is the only one that is sort of a created in the 20th century for the African-American community that, that we could identify. Um, and so I think as our research continues, you know, we would we would look into other if there are others. Um, Any other thoughts or questions, comments? All right, and, and I do wanna just also comment, thank you Com uh, Commissioner Jefferson for commenting on the design. I think when you um, are in the cemetery, it really has a very pastoral park-like setting that um, enhances the experience and really creates this very beautiful and dignified um, place for burial and I wanna, Think we have board members here, as was mentioned, and Bradford, um, Br Brandon Stratford, sorry, conflated the two names. Brandon Stratford, the president of the board, did give me a tour, and it was just an incredibly moving experience to walk through this very peaceful pastoral setting and to hear the history and the stories of the people buried there communicated so movingly uh, by uh, Brandon. So thank you for that. And thank you for all of your support as we've moved toward today. So if um, there are no other questions, I would suggest that we'd move forward. Commissioner Master, would you like to make a motion to calendar the item? Um, <coughs> just uh, oh, yeah, so moved. All right. Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? 
So second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So this Frederick Douglass Memorial Park is now calendared for consideration officially, and we will hold a public hearing in the near future. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, everyone. We'll start today's preservation department agenda with public meeting items. First is public meeting item number one, LPC 23-08657, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 170, lot 7501. 346 Broadway, AKA 108 Leonard Street and 46 Lafayette Street, the former New York Life Insurance Building individual and interior landmark. This is a Neo-Italian Renaissance style monumental skyscraper with Neo-Italian Renaissance style interiors designed by Stephen D. Hatch and McKim Mead and White, built in 1894 to 98. The application is to alter designated interior spaces and install partitions, replace windows and doors, and install signage and lighting. This was last presented at the public hearing of March 5th, 2024, and no action was taken at that time. The applicants are here to present revisions to the proposal after we open the proceedings. And let's do that right now. Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the applicants may speak. Hi, Justin. Good morning, Commissioners. Erin Rooley, Higgins, Quays, Barth, and Partners. Um, we're back today presenting the revised design for the Jack Shaman Gallery um, at the New York Life Insurance Company building. And um, joined by the whole project team. You, you just saw us two weeks ago. So um, I, I'll just say that um, uh, uh, Jack Shaman and Carlos Vega, the gallery owners and the full design team, I'm gonna take us through a brief presentation and then <laughs> um, the uh, full team is available for um, discussion. Um, commissioners, we appreciate the, the time and thoughtfulness um, uh, of your um, considered responses to the project when we were last here. Um, it was a long day, um, and uh, we, we're back with comprehensive plan that addresses both the specific concerns, um, but also just the broad approach to the project. Um, when we were here, there were um, three primary themes to your comments. First, the uh, attachment details. There we go. Um, first, the uh, attachment details, uh, the relationship of new walls to the historic space and how those walls are detailed and physically attached um, to, for us to work on the color contrast. Um, allowing the historic volume and finishes to stand out um, and to allow the new finishes to defer to the historic. Um, and then finally celebrating the ceiling um, with the lighting proposal and its potential impact on the ceiling. Um, so we're going to jump into the specifics uh, of the design changes and I'll go through them quickly um, and we can certainly discuss everything in more detail. Uh, first, just to step back and, and focus on the overall space, um, the, the original configuration of the banking hall had this narrow strip, this passageway, which was the full public extent of the public access through the space that went east-west, and then the offices um, and workspaces were on either side of that. those. Um, in the earliest configuration, we see partitions and um, uh, teller cages of uh, uh, varying levels of openness, um, and, um, and then uh, changes happened very soon thereafter, so modifications to those partitions in 1915 and relocation of the part of the teller cages, um, and then of course the introduction of the largest scale intervention in the space, um, the mezzanine in the 1920s that we see in this uh, photo on the right. This was effectively um, cutting the the space in half to create new office space. So it was not simply furniture that occupied the space; it was um, a, a collection of insertions and enclosures that um, evolved over time to accommodate the new uses. 
Um, and then historically, again, that public space was limited to that, that central pathway, the runner through the space, and that is um, very different than, than what we're um, proposing under uh, the gallery and the level of public accessibility today. Um, the 2014 project, you'll see the, the existing conditions plan in 2014 on the left. This um, plan shows a highly compartmentalized space. Um, so it was cubicles and offices that, that filled the space in the photograph, it, it shows that condition. But again, having that central pathway through the space, which was the public um, experience of, of the banking hall itself. Um, and the space has been restored um, but because the adaptive reuse project was divorced from the overall restoration, I think that the changes that we're considering now seem perhaps more impactful because we're working with a blank slate of the of the restored finishes. Um, and so in the context of what previously existed, these are really minimal incursions. And of course, every one is reversible. Um, and then just to, we thought it might be useful to give you a sense of some of the installation installations at the gallery's other locations. These are in Chelsea and, and Kinderhoof. Um, and two things that are apparent here are the, the diversity of um, the work that's shown um, and, and how the curatorial groupings are uh, critical to the experience of viewing art. So in the hearing, there were questions about the need for the, the, the permanent but reversible walls at the east and west ends, the height of those walls. Um, and um, I think that the, the intent here is to be able to show that in order to activate anything at the perimeter of the space and create um, groupings of, the, of um, viewing areas, that the permanent walls work in conjunction with the temporary installations that would be installed on the, the basis of the, the tier one, tier two um, review process. <laughs> So talking about the, the specific changes, the feature wall. This was the, um, the wall on the east end of the, of the vault um, that has been removed. Um, this originally was part, this became the enclosing wall of the, the viewing room on top of the, of the vault itself. Um, so the wall has been removed and we now see the exposed vault door, the exposed finishes and details of the vault and you can experience the massing. Um, and this is the primary entry point into the gallery. So that um, will be the, the experience of the vault um, in within the new gallery space. Um, the, the viewing room enclosure. Uh, so the commissioners uh, here were interested both in the, oops, hands on. Of the um, uh, we're in the in, we're interested in the impact of the the enclosure on the vault itself, but also the experience of it, that that enclosure within the overall space. Um, and so um, here, just looking at some historic details, before the mezzanine was added, the um, the the vault had a, a cresting. It had a marble crown, and it had a, a cresting that wrapped the the perimeter of the vault. Um, and we see the detail in the historic drawings. And then when the um, mezzanine was added, it resurfaced the, the very top of the, the vault and we have now have a railing sitting atop it. Um, you can also notice in this historic condition that the, the columns at the, at the vault actually die into the, the, the vault itself. And so it's a, a, a unique condition within the room where we don't see the full expression of those columns in the space. And so going to the um, uh, previous proposed and the revised proposal, um, uh, previous was on the left, and pr current proposal is on the right. The, um, the plan has been um, regularized. So before it was had an asymmetrical composition in part due to the, um, the introduction of that, that feature wall on the, on the east side. And so now the um, configuration is uniform, has a uniform setback around the perimeter. It is in the plane of the recessed plane of the, um, the marble itself. Um, we are proposing to recreate that um, cresting detail, the anthemia along the, the top of the cornice. And I think the really interesting thing about this is that when the mezzanine was added, um, the mezzanine, the, the railing on top of the vault, it became 
part of the mezzanine. And I think that by adding the cresting, we're taking the focus back to the vault itself, and it becomes this really primary element within the space, um, even with the reading of the partition above it. Um, and then also just looking at the plan, this is a, I know there was a lot of discussion about the need for this space. It's, it is a critical aspect of the gallery's program to have this within the banking hall. And as you can see in the plan, this is the widest place of the mezzanine. So it's important to be able to um, utilize that space. The space within the vault is not usable for program or operational functions. So this is essentially relocating that area um, atop, the, atop the vault um, and um, creating a, a, a purposeful space um, at that location. And I think because we have these unique conditions, the, the, the embedded columns, um, it does create for a, a sort of set, special set of circumstances. Um, the commissioners, you also were concerned about the potential height of this wall and wanted it dropped to the bottom of the, the capitals. Uh, the bottom of the capitals is at eight feet. It's very challenging to be able to hang and install art on an eight foot tall wall. Um, and so in thinking about this, we've really um, looked to the, the unique condition atop the vault, how the the, the restored crenellation at the at the crown of the, the vault might emphasize the vault itself, and then the the um, uh, interruption of the the columns themselves because they are distinct from elsewhere in in the um, within the banking hall. And so, uh, the proposed is uh, on the right. We'll look at that in a bit more detail. Um, the previous proposed on the left. And the existing, and just to give you a sense of height and scale, the the enclosure is nine six, um, and the the marble surround on the vault door is at eleven is eleven feet tall. So I think you know when we zoom into these renderings, it's very hard um, to get get an overall sense of the, the scale and impact in a room. But um, just as as a um, point of comparison, the door is as big. The vault door is nearly as big as the enclosure above. Um, and as, just as a note, here's the detail for the, the new uh, cresting. Um, it will be uh, made to be removable in case it's need, it needs to be um, accessed for the installation of art and it can go back and forth easily. Partitions, uh, commissioners were um, uh, concerned about um, the engagement of the um, walls to the columns, which um, originally uh, were proposed to connect at the midpoint of each column. Again, all of the enclosed spaces are tucked away um, on that south side of the, under the mezzanine where the um, existing louvers are located to allow for mechanical connections um, and also the uh, necessary um, partitioning and enclosure of spaces for critical uh, operational and, and programmatic needs. And so um, the revised design will um, not engage at the columns. It returns around the base of the column which we see here. And then this line back here, this is the cast iron backup. So when the, the mezzanine was created, cast iron backups were installed at the back of the columns and then they've been clad over in marble, but um, that gives you a little bit of a, a reveal at the back of the column, which will be a point of engagement for, for one location. And so here, just to give you a sense of how this all works, um, the, the wall will be pulled back. We can see around the column, and then we have that deep reveal at the top of the wall, which gives you that sense of a, a floating plane within um, the, the um, recessed behind the, the column itself. Uh, similar condition here um, in the, the reception office. Um, and then finally at the um, library. This is a, a slightly more complicated solution only because it's two walls intersecting. And so it's going to um, go behind the, around the base of the column and then it will engage at that, that cast iron backup um, behind the column there, which I think was um, one of a recommendation of one of the commissioners um, during the hearing. Mezzanine niche. This is the uh, sculpture niche up on the mezzanine, had a partition at the window that has been removed. And then um, finishes. So I think um, in talking about the the discussion of the finishes, the um, primary concern was that the the finishes drew too much attention to themselves and detracted or distract distracted um, from the experience of the historic space. Um, commissioners, that was not the intent at all. Um, 
that there is a need for a neutral background, um, but um, for the viewing of art, but I think our, our renderings misrepresented the the intent and the effect of the finishes. Um, white, of course, is the industry standard, um, but we we went um, and performed some samples to make sure that it does work in terms of the palette, and we'll take a look at that. Um, the film is also being changed just to, to a more translucent film. This is on the windows um, to give you a sense of what's happening on the exterior while still allowing for it to quiet the, the interior for the experience of art. Um, and then here is a, a sample. So we can see on the left is a, a sample of the, the specific paint and wall finish. This is existing marble within the window. And then on the right is the, are the new windows um, in which are also white um, with uh, as part of the restoration. And you can see that the, the white is actually uh, within the tonal range of the marble, but because the marble is always going to be figured and um, have more character, the um, we believe and um, I think that this clearly conveys that the the walls themselves will recede and it wasn't it will not have um, any of the the sort of brightness that was conveyed in the in the renderings previously uh, similarly with the floor uh, uh, this is the existing condition of the floor it has a lot of color variation and um, the intent is to have a, a light gray finish we've attempted to do a a sample. Um, I, I can't say that it is exactly where we want to be, but um, you'll see that the, the marble runner is here. Did we have this broad concrete band? This is where the teller walls were attached to the floor. So this is a border on each side. And so the intent here is to really find something that works tonally with everything. Um, nothing, it, and and I, we're very happy to work with staff to achieve the right sample um, in terms of getting the stain to a, a place where it is neutral enough, um, but um, still compatible with all of the other finishes. Um, the ceiling. Uh, commissioners um, had varying comments about the ceiling, and but uniformly, it was the um, they wanted the um, uh, ceiling to be respected in terms of the the overall lighting design. And just as a reminder of what the the ceiling um, is um, in terms of its architecture, these uh, coffered sections, octagonal coffers that are framed by a rectilinear grid. Um, that grid is flat plaster that's painted a, this sort of ochre color. Um, and so the, the original scheme was to um, attach the light fixtures tightly to the, the flat plaster. So uh, it would be a projection below the flat plaster. It wasn't hung or suspended. It was actually attached to, so tight, and trying to accentuate the reading of the, the ceiling's architecture, um, never trying to diminish it. And so um, in this diagram, you can see like the intersecting grids um, of the of the existing ceiling. And we feel really strongly that this is the right approach to installing lighting at this location. They need a lot of um, uh, flexibility in terms of the exhibit lighting. And um, we, we have made some revisions, as you can see from the uh, previously proposed and the current proposed plan, simplified it a bit. But the, the intent here is for a continuous grid. It extends down about two and a half inches it's painted out to match the ceiling and it's continuous. We'll look at the detail, but we really feel as though dropping a, a suspended grid or another lighting structure below the ceiling, given this very strong and dynamic architecture of the ceiling, that that would be incredibly distracting um, at, from, a, from below. And so here are the, um, the details. You can see the track here. This is, it's a combination of the ambient lighting, oh, I'm sorry, I'll just go back to this briefly. Red is indicating the track lighting, so exhibition lighting. Um, green are the, the linear fixtures that light the room, and then there are pendants proposed in the coffers themselves. You can see from the previous proposal that we have reduced all of the, the fixtures and simplified the schemes at the north and south ends of the space. And then looking at those details, so the track lighting here is um, will project down two and a half inches. That can house any number of, of light fixtures, different lighting types. It's essentially creating the power source for the um, lighting per exhibit. And then the linear light fixture is within that same housing. It has the same exact finish, same dimension. And then the, the light source is tucked within the bottom of that, that housing. And so, and then when they intersect, 
the linear, we see this in the plan, the linear fixture continues through. So there's, it doesn't drop below, it doesn't change plane. It's a very sophisticated detail where the track, um, the, the tracks can run through each other and then you get that continuous light um, along the, the, the north-south um, beams. East-west, sorry. Um, and then, so here we see the, um, the rendering in, in of the ceiling for previously proposed and in current proposal, um, and where the, the tracks are running along the, the beams and the linear lights are intersecting. And again, I think this is a little deceptive because it feels like they're not in the same plane and they are, and the light is held within the housing. So that linear beam that we're seeing is within the housing itself. Um, also the pendants, um, there were some comments about um, height of the pendants. We've, we've pulled them up. They are intended to uh, the architectural lighting, up lighting the proper, we pulled them up so they don't break the ceiling plane. And um, as you can see in the top left, this was a, uh, historically there was a, a dark rosette at the center of each of the coffers. And so we have um, darkened the finish of this to a, a dark bronze consistent with what we're seeing in the, in the capitals um, nearby. Oops, I'm going to go back there, sorry. Uh, here, the previous proposal juxtaposed with the current proposal. And then I thought this would be useful because this is the existing ceiling versus the, the proposed ceiling. And so you get a sense of how really minimal the effect is of the, of the new track system because it is a, a, you know, a minor dimensional change just attached um, at, the, at the flat plaster and, and of course finished to match exactly as the as the existing ceiling is. Under the mezzanine, we're removing the suspended light fixtures um, in favor of some minimal um, track lighting along the perimeter under the mezzanine. Um, and here we can see the previous proposed that sort of suspended light beam, and then here's the, the new proposal. Um, and that'll give effective lighting in both directions. And then finally, um, just to um, walk through the space with you. So here are our views in all directions. This is the existing condition of the space. Um, I think uh, this is what I was talking about, about the mezzanine sort of becoming more of the identity of the vault in the existing condition. Here was our previous proposal. And here is the current proposal um, without in the absence of art, um, just to give you a sense of all of the, the component parts and essential, and this is again the, the the bare essentials that are needed by for the gallery for both um, operational and programmatic uses. It is a place of business. It is not an art museum necessarily just for exhibits. Um, they need to function as well. Um, and and I think that we've been able to distill the um, the proposal down to the essential parts um, in part due to the work of. LPC staff and, and your helpful comments. And um, and then also just to be able to see it, what it might what it might look like with um, art activating the space. And um, these are just a few ideas that give you a sense of one, the diversity of the um, art shown um, by the gallery and but also just the, um, the, the primary reading of the architecture, the secondary reading of the art and I think all of the, the um, enclosures and partitions that we're talking about here are really um, uh, become a tertiary element within the room. They are meant to be the background um, while accommodating the, the basic needs for, for the gallery. And I think um, just in closing, I think we heard that um, in the testimony at the hearing um, that this is a, a somewhat groundbreaking and risky endeavor for, for the gallery um, and that this space has been on the market for seven years without a viable use. Um, it's been a labor of love on behalf of Carlos and Jack. Um, it's enormously expensive and um, it's been a, a very challenging two years. Um, but um, these spaces could not have better stewards. The preservation ethos is embedded in everything that the gallery does. And I think um, because every aspect is reversible and it is going to provide unprecedented public access to the space, I think this is really something that um, everyone is going to be quite proud of um, when it comes to fruition. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have questions? Okay. Uh, yes. Commissioner Ginsburg. So I, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. I still question the pendants at the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And 
why couldn't the ceiling be lit with track lights on the tracks instead of having to put in that separate element? So that's one question. And then the other question, the wall under the stair at the scissors lift mm -hmm. that extended above the stair, mm -hmm. is it still extending it, above the it, stair? And I know a number of us have commented on that. Mm -hmm. And if so, why? Right. So I think the, uh, we'll go back to the, um, yes. Uh, but uh, in terms of the wall, that is, I think we talked about it in the hearing, the need for these sort of dual purpose walls where they compartmentalize space, but then also provide um, display area. And that is one of the three permanent walls that are needed in order to provide display area. And if we keep it lower, then I, I think, I don't know if this is showing um, art in that location, but it really requires the full height to be able to hang anything um, in within that location. So it, it is detailed the same way as everything else with the deep reveal um, at, the, at the top of the wall and the relocated molding, but it is critical um, to the program. And it, again, it's there are three of these walls, two on the west side and one on the east side. Maybe Pepe, could you right. speak yeah. to the um, interesting? Well, I want to add something along this wall. Yes, my name is Osolis Federico. I'm uh, okay. the architect of record for the IT architecture. Uh, in response also to the display that we're extending all the way on, on the stairs, it has also the functionality of behind we're keeping the scissor lift that we need to um, do management on the on the ceiling. So if we actually bring it lower, then we need to step it in and we wouldn't have enough room to actually um, locate that scissor lift behind. So about the lighting, uh, can you ask that again exactly? The okay, way my, my question is why you need the pendants and couldn't you light the ceiling with track light from the track so you didn't have to put right. in the pendant? Okay. So the actual pendant, you actually need to be below and the projection of the light cannot be from the lane that we're having the track light. You're not in the right angle to do that. So in order to do that, we'll have to drop down the track lights, which is what definitely we wanted to avoid because we had a, a great opportunity of keeping the consistency and the character of this crisscross of the existing ceiling. So this light that we're having, like they are within that plane of light and actually are the right angle to, to be able to illuminate the entire couple. And the way that it's done and copying this uh, darker color, uh, it really diffuse and blend perfectly with the ceiling and it doesn't distract from the character of it. Thank you. So, do you think with the, the lighting that comes from it, depth, depth perception will be sort of obscured and it'll read more like the dark rosette in the center? Right. Yeah, right. okay. And, and I think if we go back to that slide that we can see the existing, the burnt uh, and the new, this is what we're actually very excited about, how we were able to really take the, it is not in that case. Yeah, so let me try to establish this. One more, and it's probably right here. So you see the left versus the right, the opportunity of having, you know, matching the color of that flat cluster. And if you see those pendant lights, the circular, it really connects with those rosettes that you see on the column thread, not only the capital, but you also have these round rosettes over there, and it really connects all together quite well. Okay. okay. Commissioner Goldblum, followed by Commissioner Chapin. Uh, what's the color? The color of the, of the head, the same or matching also the okay. last the, the kind of base color. Okay. 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 And, um, I think at the, at the hearing there were comments about the uh, uh, re requesting changes to the uh, plan, you know, the art display plan. The re was there any comments? Were there any responses to those comments? Uh, this was the um, comment regarding tier one installations right. and limiting the height of tier one installations. Uh, we did we did um, consider that um, the issue is um, that it felt like it set a sort of arbitrary um, uh, uh, limitation on all of the elements. It's very much intended to be a dynamic installation and very fluid, and it would limit wall height sculptures 
even that, and, and currently there is a very, for what we hope is the September opening, um, there's a very large piece being considered as part of that, and um, that would um, exceed that. So it, from a, the artistic mm -hmm. perspective, the, that limitation is challenging. Um, beyond that, it's also possible that things are going to hang from the ceiling and down. So setting a limit at the mezzanine um, sort of confuses those those two tiers of, um, of installation. And that's the flexibility is really built in to be able to do things from the ceiling and the floor. Um, and so it's it was not a disregarded comment in any way. It, it was it was carefully considered, but we we feel it's very important to maintain variety within the the ability to um, create installations under tier one. Okay, and Commissioner Chapin followed by Commissioner Jefferson. Yeah, uh, could you just comment on uh, what plans uh, you're going to develop uh, to? Uh, Take care of any historic materials that you know have to be stored. Sure. Okay. Yes. Um. Uh. It's a very good question. Um. There is a space dedicated in the ba basement cellar, oh. cellar of the of the gallery itself. Um. And everything will be removed. Those elements. It's the marble and the railing. Um. Will be removed and stored intact. Um. And um. The and of course. The, the gallery is in the business of protecting art. So we, we um, trust that it will be um, managed properly. And do you think a sort of written plan could be submitted as part of we the package? We can absolutely do that, yes. Great, thank you. All right, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, yes, if you go to slide number 35 um, and the bottom image, and, and you see the, there is the existing image and the, the the original ceiling mm -hmm. and the new ceilings are are both on the same competitive level. They're equal in 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 aesthetic value. Then you go to the right image and the existing ceiling is subordinate. Which one is right? Is the existing ceiling a background for the lighting for the grid? Or is it are they playing with each other? What what's really going on? No, there? I think I think is that... the grid dominant. Yeah. A, question is, and then you have these pendants dropping down from that, mm -hmm. that mean they connect together spatially, mm -hmm. or is the, the, the existing ceiling subordinate to the new ceiling? And what's... I always look forward to your questions. <laughs> I, think, I, I, I think that the existing ceiling is dominant, and that the, the track system, and I, I, I think, it, again, it's very hard to represent this in rendering, because the lights, the linear light fixtures are shown on here. So they're, um, they're and it's a rendering, it's not real life. Um, and we're showing some installation of, of lighting fixtures, but it may not, it's, this is always going to be evolving. This is one moment in time. And so I do think that the, the, the ceiling itself reads as primary and that the grid works within it. And I, I think and believe that it will actually disappear um, and that all you will read is the ceiling and that um, and that it will read as though there are some fixtures attached that address the the this installations at that moment. Um, in terms of the pendant, I think that the pendant height, because it is contained within the within the grid itself, it's it's up above it, that it it is going to reinforce the reading of each of the coffers um, because it's picking up on that that dark finish that was there historically. So it's the dominant reading is the existing or the existing? It's absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that the existing is already a sort of a mixed reading of a dominant plaster grid with the coffered uh, panels. And so um, I think your idea is that the fixtures sort of blend away with the plaster grid that are, that is part of a historic ceiling. All right, um, other questions? Yes, all right, let me just introduce you. Commissioner Lutfi. Thank you. What What's the maximum height that a piece of art can be right now? Is there a maximum height? I'm There's just- No maximum height. Okay, no. I'm just, and, and so in terms of the height of the ceiling, and I know there's no such thing as a traditional gallery space, but 
in terms of the height of the ceiling and a let's let's just talk about like Soho or West Chelsea or whatever. What what would a traditional height of a ceiling be in a gallery? I, I'm just I'm just wondering. Well, yeah, I know it varies, but yeah. it but like what's in in, in a warehouse building, uh, sixteen feet. Sixteen feet. feet. And yeah. and what's the height of this? Twenty eight. And so theoretically, like you you know how when um, two trees put that art in the dom beautiful art in the Domino Sugar Factory. Theoretically, if something very large were to come in it could be accommodated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that that's sort of the magic of the space. I think you sort of hit the nail on the head is that right. it doesn't have to be constrained. It, it is a very different conception here. Um, and and that's, you know, a lot of the modifications that we went through in the last, at, at the hearing are to accommodate large scale moving those pieces through the space. Um, and so that's certainly the vision is to be able to do something really special. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any final questions? Other questions? So we could put David, the statue of David could go nicely. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, I guess we're ready for our discussion. So thank you for the well-organized presentation and getting through the basic themes from our discussion last time. And as Aaron pointed out, we did discuss last time and we had a, a, a lot of different suggestions, but I think really the essence of them got to the um, heights and attachment points of the partitions, um, the finishes and ensuring the right conference contrast and uh, to allow that ceiling to remain dark, but also deference to the historic finishes um, in terms of scheme, as well as thinking about that floor surface. And um, also we had comments about how to handle the viewing room above the vault. And again, a lot of different suggestions for that. The applicants studied that and have come back with a proposal to restore the cresting to sort of complete the vault so that the viewing room meets a second and they've adjusted the placement of it as well. And uh, we also had comments about the ceiling and the lighting, which we've just talked about extensively. So. Um, the applicants have come back with a response for those comments, and um, and I think I think you presented also there was a comment about the window facing the alley, and that's been removed from the scheme. Um, so I think just to provide some context for our discussion, I, I do want to point out some things that Aaron pointed out in the beginning of the presentation that um, this space um, historically had partitions and dividers in the form of partitions, but also teller cages that really um, sort of controlled public access. And the proposal today uh, allows for a use that would really provide more access than has ever been in this uh, throughout the space's history. Um, and I think that when we think about the, uh, the proposal, we can also think about these original partitions and divisions and teller cages and how that space had historically been divided. Um, in addition with the 20th century mezzanine that essentially added a, a, another floor for office space, again with partitions. And then at the time of designation, uh, really where we started, where the space had been heavily partitioned off for office use. And um, so today we are fortunate that we're looking at an open restored space, but I think that we can look at these proposals, these installations in the context of how this space was historically used as we think about how to accommodate a new use. And I think the other um, point that I wanted to reiterate that Aaron had mentioned was that I think we can think of all of these installations as reversible. They um, even the ones that will be in place all the time can be easily reversed. And then, of course, the ones that are for the changing exhibits uh, will come and go with the changing exhibits. And the applicant today has said that they would develop a, a written plan for the removal and storage of anything that needed to be removed to accommodate these walls, a storage plan for that um, to ensure that they're protected. So um, we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Lutfi, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, 
first uh thank you to the applicant you not only did a lot of you've done a lot of work but you, you've come back very quickly so uh, it's just another example of your tremendous enthusiasm and commitment to this project and um trying to make it work in a way that respects the architecture of this uh, interior landmark while meeting your goals, which I, I appreciate. So um, I'm just gonna take these sort of one by one and Sarah, you referred to some of them, but I'm just gonna repeat them because um, I think they're important. First is that um, <clears throat> every incursion made into the space is going to be reversible. I think that's really, really important. And um, I think it is important to, you know, work with staff to uh, ensure that that process, there's a process that exists for that. And also wherever um, original material is uh, removed, that that is, uh, there's a plan for storage and and ultimately can come back. Um, I, I think the fact that, um, you know, I'm very support, I was very supportive of this project in uh, the last hearing and uh, I appreciate uh, some of the changes you've made and some of them I think have really enhanced the project. So for example, this whole uh, slightly separating the uh, presentation walls from the columns, I think it really does help them read better and it does not diminish uh, from the goal of having large enough uh, presentation walls. And I thank my fellow commissioners for making that suggestion. And I, I do feel like um, there is a communication. I felt like it existed before. I think it's even strengthened now that the permanent uh, walls and the temporary walls kind of speak and relate to each other in a way that I think um, enables the original shell of the space to, uh, you know, be visually apparent, but also kind of communicates that there's something else going on here. Uh, I'm fine with the removal of, and I agree about the removal of the feature wall, um, so that which we recommended so they can now see the the vault. Um, I actually I like this idea of the cresting on top of the. Uh, on top of the vault and and I think in the images that you've shown it really does help to draw a distinction between that viewing space and the vault and uh, because you're recreating something that no longer existed I think it's important for you to work with staff on the details of this as well. Um, in the let's see in terms of some of the finishes, I think the change in the um, the film to make it more translucent on the windows was a very good idea. I, I really um, appreciate the changes that you've made to the ceiling lighting plan. Look, this is a very distinctive ceiling and in and of itself, it's, you know, it's got ornate characteristics and it's a darker color. And number one, if you walk in and the space is not lit, it has a presence. And I think what you're doing here, and I appreciate your change in, although I like the original one, within the hanging, I'm gonna call it rosette um, light, I truly believe that, and I, I love what, what you did with the track lighting and the grid. Um, I truly believe that you're not only going to accomplish your goal of 
lighting the space overall and casting light on the works below it. But I feel like you're going to draw attention to the ceiling in a very positive and beautiful way. And I remember when um, I keep thinking about like the beautiful job I keep re that Herzog and de Morant did with the ceiling on the first floor of the the lighting in the Park Avenue Armory. They, you know, they had new fixtures, but they really spoke to what was there originally from a, you know, contextual standpoint and the ceiling and the woodwork in that room are just, you know, just sort of glow from the lighting. And I have a feeling that that is going to happen here so I can support this. Um, and I, I'm okay with the wall. I even even though I originally uh, agreed with the fact that it would be nice if the wall where the scissor lift is could be lowered, I appreciate the fact that you need to show art. And it uh, that's what the space is all about. And it needs to be accommodated and I can, I can support that. I also, uh, I was absolutely fine with the, the gray tone of the floor originally, uh, you know, thinking that I didn't, you know, especially where the floor hits the walls and the art is shown, it's very important that the floor does not distract to me. So, and that is a reason I believe why gallery floors are so often gray. But this slight move to make them, to still have a gray tone, but make them neutral um, and blend a little more with the original uh, material in the floor, I think works. And I also feel, feel like aesthetically, not having such a tremendous contrast between the existing floor and the, you know, the stone floor and the wood floor is is beautiful. I think it's going to read in a very beautiful, elegant way. So I can support this. And finally, I raised um, the whole question about uh, the height of the ceilings and being able to accommodate unusually sized work because there's something going on here that I think is very important. And there are not a lot of spaces around the world, although there are more in uh, Europe than there are here that are a word that um, many people in the art world are familiar with are like a Kunsthalle space where, you know, you can actually go in and present oversized, overscaled work, an unusual work that might not fit in a more traditional museum or gallery space. So in that respect, I feel like you are doing something that is, you know, relatively speaking, you know, a little groundbreaking here within this market. And uh, it's a positive thing. And, and I can su support that as well, as, as is your move down to a neighborhood that I don't really quite call Tribeca, but, um, but down to a neighborhood that has not been, uh, that, that isn't populated by a lot of galleries that you're going to help um, to, uh, you know, make active in a way that, you know, if you think about the, I'm just to change industries and for a moment, if you think about what uh, Danny Meyer did in Flatiron, I mean, he, you know, sparked changes in that neighborhood. And I think you're going to do the same and uh, attract not only people who traditionally come to see work in your gallery and the wonderful artists that you uh, present, but but hopefully just the regular person who's uh, you know 
in the neighborhood for whatever. So thank you very much. I can support this. Thank you. Commissioner Master. Um, so the first time um, we saw this, um, I supported this wholeheartedly. And um, I just have to say that the changes that you've made um, have just made this uh, this project even better. Um, so I, I agree with Commissioner Lutfi's statements, and I'm very excited um, to see this move forward. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson? Um, I, th I think it'll be a very exciting place to display art, and I think the, the architect displayed a, certain, a high level of skill in certain parts of it that really um, fascinated me. The, um, the room, for example, just having the, uh, what is it called? Uh, well, the, the the edge piece, putting in that little, but I just cresting. I, I just made it work. You know, before that it didn't work, and just that linear element made it work. So that's really beautifully done. I think the the niche works, the finishes work. I mean, the the, uh, the ceiling. I'm not quite sure if it's going to be more dominant than the grid is very strong. I mean, I I think, but. Yeah. It, it works well. It's 28 feet up there, so you're not going to see it. The only issue I have with all of this is that, uh, you know, this stuff is going to be removed, but it's really hard to put it back. And I would like to know how they put it back. Are they going to drill holes to put it back? Are they going to use plaster? How do you put plaster back? I've tried that in the past. It's extremely difficult. So there should be a plan that. LPC should have to say, how are you going to put it back? Yeah. You know, ahead of time. Okay. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah. Uh, I uh, think that, you know, this reminds me of obviously the importance of having an appropriate use for landmark interior spaces, which is often, you know, a considerable challenge and uh, just terribly important for the health of those spaces and for public accessibility. I think that this is a great use. I'm very pleased about the, the uh, proposal to have a gallery here. Um, maybe, you know, in the future there can be, for when the public visits, you know, some uh, materials, photographs to show the original space just to, you know, could could just be present for people to look at while they're there, as the as you look at a book of uh, art uh, exhibits. But anyway, uh, I think I'm I wasn't here when it was reviewed first, and I uh, agree with the changes recommended by other commissioners, and I think they've they've done a good job in, in following up and accomplishing those. I think the lighting is the most difficult. But uh, I think, given the use uh, that they and the need for the lighting, that they have done the best they could uh, with uh, those issues. And I think I agree with Commissioner Jefferson that the height of the ceiling will make that, uh, you know, less of a an issue of perception. Um, and um, I. You know, I, I just think it's a, a great use, and I think can support the use of the, this use, uh, and, and you know, knowing that they are going to take due care with the uh, historic artifacts that are going to be preserved. So, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, Lighting is fine. I would like to be the uh, special me, especially from perspective. I think there's a chance to color and to match the ceiling more or less. I think that the crafting forces a nice addition. I don't think it's not just on that, but uh, I think that coupled with the fairly generous uh, temporary wall provisions that we are 
probably going to approve. I don't think that there's a major point to consider. We need to full height of the space in many locations for an extended period of time. So I think as a permanent fixture and certainly the centerpiece of the room, the height should be going to the top two lines at the bottom. Uh, I think that the uh, perimeter wall detail proposed for the perimeter walls is uh, improvement. Um, I still think that the uh, I think the center the center wall the one with the, with the green piece of art in this uh, image can stay as it should stay as it is, but I think the side ones the ones that flank on either side should come down to the height of the capital uh, the cast iron capitals. Um, I think otherwise the application is, is uh, totally appropriate and I think it's a great opportunity. It's plan, I guess it's no longer, but I, it just seems like it's, 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 it allows for a lot of flexibility, but I would hate to have it the ability to see the space for a benefit that is not greater than above. But I trust that the staff and staff interpret the regulation such that that will Commissioner Ginsburg. So I just want to say I think this use is a great use for the space and finding a use where the public can come in uh and and see it and that it works and is functional uh i think everything that has been done since the last presentation is an improvement uh i still have some questions on the lighting but understand why it's needed so i i can approve this and i'm very much looking forward to seeing it being built commissioner chen yeah, uh, likewise, yes. I think the, uh, uh, as been alluded by uh, fellow commissioners, this is a very creative, adaptive reuse, and it's been dormant for too long, and I'm, I'm excited to see that the public will get access to it. Uh, the beauty of this project is obviously uh, relying on working on the staff, with the staff uh, about the adaptability, uh, given the constraint of the site. I. I totally agree with uh, Commissioner Ginsburg that you have responded to the commissioner's uh, concern last time. I think that I like what you've done with the windows, uh, so that the exterior. Um, yeah, the ceiling grid is a challenge. Uh, I, I, I understand the thing. So compared to the vault before, I think um, um, looking forward to seeing it, uh, especially like the cresting. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so um, understanding Commissioner Goldberg, your continued concerns about um, the heights of some of these walls, I think we do have enough to support this as is. And and overall, I think we are all very excited to see this use go in here. We commend you for taking it on and really making this, um, having the vision to make this space um, what I think will be a really wonderful public amenity and a great way to a great addition to the neighborhood so we'll go ahead and make a motion to approve with the condition that they submit the written plan for the um, removal storage and restoration of um, any architectural features and work with the staff on the final finishes okay um everyone please be patient this is going to take some time <laughs> <laughs> In the matter of docket, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> In the matter of docket 23-0865734640, Broadway, um, Broadway Avenue, 108 Leonard Street, 46 Lafayette Street, former New York Life Insurance Building, Individual and Interior Landmark. I know, oh, no, I don't, yes that the mezzanine in the banking hall and railing around, oh, what were you going to say? No, no. Yeah, around, uh, railing around the vault were not original to the space, but were added in circa 1923. I also note that the building was recently converted to a condominium 
with a ground floor retail area and residential units at the top floors and that the second floor executive offices were previously approved to be private residential units, including encapsulation of some walls and installation of new partitions and that this work has been completed. I further note that none of the violations in place apply to the banking hall or executive office spaces. With regard to the permanent gallery scope of work, I recommend approval with modifications finding that the proposed modifications to the interior banking hall and executive offices will help facilitate the adaptive reuse and provide much greater public access to these interior landmarks than ever existed before. That the designated spaces have always been working spaces and featured partitions and office furnishings and the proposed installations, including reception desk, workstations, office pods, fan coil units, and window shades are similar in function feature minimal attachment points will be reversible and will allow the adaptive reuse of the banking hall. That the, the design and scale of the installations are simple and modest and will not detract from the monumental character of the banking hall. That the permanent yet reversible interior partitions will support the operational needs of the gallery and are largely limited to areas under the mezzanine along the alley facade are installed in front of simple stone walls, thereby allowing more visibility of the significant features and volume of the central space while helping to minimize the future need for penetrations through marble for mounting artwork. That the installation of metal cresting at the top of the bank vault cornice will recall the historic metal detailing that was previously removed and will visually separate the vault from the simple partitions with a small reveal added on top of it and will preserve a clear reading of the massing of the original vault. That the glass, metal, and wood materials of the proposed installations are neutral in color, simple and contemporary in design, will selectively allow views to historic fabric and therefore will not compete with the significant architectural features of the designated interiors. That the penetrations through the marble walls for mechanical vents are limited in quantity, designed to be as small as possible and will be concealed by the new partitions or receive louvers finished to blend with the adjacent stone thereby not calling it undue attention to themselves that the creation of a new door at the banking hall mezzanine is necessary to provide direct access between gallery spaces that the historic wood molding at the executive office side and oculus will be incorporated into the door and the marble cladding will be replicated in wood and plaster with painted faux veining, thereby retaining the symmetrical appearance of the east wall that the historic fabric to be removed to create the door will be salvaged and stored on site, allowing for future reinstallation, and that plaster and wood are typically used at historic interiors of this age and style to replicate stone and are consistent with the mix of materials at this interior, that the widening of certain existing interior door openings will only result in the removal of recently replaced infill and that the new doors will be simply designed and will not call undue attention to themselves. That the changes to the flooring throughout the spaces, including refinishing the wood banking hall floor and installing new linoleum and ceramic, ceramic tile flooring at the mezzanine and executive offices will not result in the removal of historic fabric and will not detract from the significant features of the interior that relocating the plaster ceiling molding at select locations in the banking hall will allow the decorative plaster to remain fully visible despite new proposed alterations. And the plaster features a repetitive motif that will be easy to reinstall in the original locations in the future. That the anchor points in the banking hall ceiling will facilitate flexibility for exhibition installations and will be finished to blend with the decorative plaster work. The structural truss system will only be installed periodically when needed for an exhibit 
and the floor supports will be concealed by panels of the original wood flooring will not be located in the central marble portion of the floor, thereby reducing the physical and visual impact of these installations. One more page. Let me, let me pause for a little yes. drink. <laughs> that the lighting fixtures located within the ceiling, the highly decorative ceiling are well integrated and the architecture are simply designed and finished to harmonize with historic finishes, that one of the executive office spaces at the second floor will be re-encapsulated with new reversible partitions to allow for display of art while maintaining the underlying historic trim that the application of translucent will window film to block exterior light necessary in a gallery to protect artwork will not alter the windows, will be reversible and will not detract from the uniform appearance of windows from the exterior. That installing new exterior doors at the Lafayette and Broadway facades, featuring transoms that can be operated in tandem with the doors will not result in the removal of historic fabric and the change in operation will only be evident while artwork is being removed in and out of the space. That the proposed doors will be simple in design and finished to match the existing ground in, uh, floor infill, therefore they will harmonize with the color palette of the building. That the exterior signs consisting of stainless steel wraparound plaques will not exceed the size of the st stone coins and will not call undue attention to themselves. That the proposed replacement of windows on Catherine Lane is only obliquely visible from Lafayette Street and will match the configuration, finish, materials, and details of the previously approved replacement windows. Therefore, the change in operation to a full casement window to facilitate movement of art will not be perceptible from the public thoroughfare. I also recommend that the applicant work very closely with LPC staff to develop an acceptable plan for the removal and storage of historic materials um, and that the applicant work with staff on the details of, of the crusting at the top of the vault and other installation details and finishes to minimize impact to historic fabric and harmonize with the interior spaces. And that in the future, if and when the adaptive reuse ceases in the banking hall or executive offices, the applicant and or owner will remove and reverse the specified alterations and restore the spaces to their previous conditions in consultation with staff or return to the commission and seek approval to retain and or make other modifications. With regard to the temporary exhibit related installations, I recommend approval finding that the exhibit related installations will be limited in duration and the tiered levels of review will allow flexibility for art installations to interact with the designated spaces while ensuring the commission can adequately protect and provide visual access to significant historic features and that the length of exhibitions will be limited to a maximum of two years, therefore the installations will not diminish the special architectural and historic character of this individual landmark. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Master, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you, Mark. Will you, uh, John, will you call the vote? <laughs> Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Mm. No. Uh, Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Luckby? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Seven in favor, one opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved. Thank you very much and good luck. We look forward to seeing the gallery in, in use. All right, we'll move, to, yeah, we'll move to the next item. All right, we'll now move to public meeting item number two, LPC 24-03142, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1228, lot 29. 420 Amsterdam Avenue, the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District. 
This is a Romanesque revival style flats building with Renaissance revival style elements designed by Gilbert A. Schellinger and built in 1890 to 91. The application is to legalize and closing the areaway, replacing the fence and installing a garbage enclosure without LPC permits. This was read into the record at the public hearing of February 13th, 2024, uh, but was not presented at that time and will be seen uh, and heard for the first time today. Uh, the applicants will present the proposal after we open the hearing. Let's go ahead and do that now. Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to open the hearing? So moved. And uh, Commissioner Master, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. Oh. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is open. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Shlomo Steve Wagoda. I'm here, I think, for at least the 20th time. Nice to see you again, sir. Um, so we're, uh, it's a relatively simpler application. And that's just to uh, present fence uh, that we built behind some trash cans which the city of New York would not require those that those cans are on wheels. So uh, I'm gonna allow Sherman to my office his first time presenting. So be nice to him. And uh, so he's gonna present, I'll be here. Good morning ladies and gentlemen and um Okay, so this is a laser fix. So I'm hoping for an easy yes from all of you uh, in obtaining the certificate of appropriateness and the legalization of the railing and the enclosed uh, garbage. Um, this is at 420 Amsterdam Avenue and it's located at the corner of Amsterdam Avenue and 80th Street. So this is a 1940s uh, tax photo for your reference. Another photo of that with a, at the bottom corner, there's a portion of the railing that you can see, which is very blurry. And we are standing across and at the corner, uh, you'll see the entire building and there's a markup over there, uh, red markup. Uh, where they enclosed uh, um, garbage and the and the railing as well. So this is a close-up photos of the areaway with the railing halfway, and the second half of it is the uh, garbage enclosure. Another photo of that. Um, this shows that the two. Uh, garbage enclosure is like a dumpster with a caster that you can roll in and out of the platform. And this is the areaway with the uh, storage, now a storage uh, with the uh, steel doors. So these are the reference photos of the neighborhood along 80th Street um, with the same language of design with the vertical um, square bars painted in black and the uh, uh, garbage enclosure, similar to what we have. Another reference of that, some are in transparent made of mesh and they're all black painted. So at the top drawing is, we labeled it as existing, but that was, that means existing that was before it was altered. So you will see the steps with the entire um, areaway when you're standing at the sidewalk, you can see below. And at the bottom of it, the proposed, which is the current condition, which we have the, the steps going down to the cellar and halfway of that is are the dumpsters or the garbage enclosure. And this is the, the, the photo of the railing, which was, which was the original design of it. And it was taken in 19 forgotten. Um, so 
that's just a reference. And that's another reference of the of the railing in 454 Amsterdam Avenue, similar to what we have. And that's it. Okay. But the two, if you go back two slides to the black and white photos, is that this is your building, correct? At the time of designation or I suppose so. Okay. Yeah. So but the color photos are a different building. A different building. Okay. All right. The um, color photo is at the four five four. Okay. Right. Questions, Commissioners? Uh, all right. Commissioner Goldblum, followed by Commissioner Ginsburg. No, uh, so we have two things. So we have old, your, your exist, the existing condition for you modified was that the plain picket fence went from the stairs all the way to the end. Correct. And now you've got these dumpster things and a shortened version of the, the railing. Plain tickets on the far left of the service store. Correct. So I guess the question is what happened to that historic railing that probably used to be where your plain ticket railing is now? We don't know. We don't know. It's that, been that like that for years. years. So was, was that already removed when you did the work for the garbage enclosure? Yes, with the seven. Um, with the seven. Let me see what the address is and I can tell you. Yeah, I mean, the historic 40, district. 40, 40, oh, this would have been um, 1990, I think. So 1990. So, so, the reason, so you owned it sometime after 1990. Okay. Other questions? Yes, yeah. Commissioner Ginsburg, so just sorry. Following up, do you know why the fence was removed and who removed it? And did they know they were doing it? against uh, landmark rules without having filed with landmarks. So um, they, they have known, they may not have known. We don't know that answer either. And when they removed it, it was in order to create a fence that has gates on it to allow these garbage things to flow. So we don't know to be specific to your question. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right, let's see if we have public testimony. Is there anyone in the room who'd like to speak on this item? Yes, yes, no, okay. Um, noting that there is no one in the room to speak, I will turn it over to Stephen Thompson to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Uh, We have two um, uh, registered remote participants. The first is Megan Fitzpatrick with Landmark West. Uh, Megan Fitzpatrick, please raise your hand and I will promote you to panelist, after which I will, um, would you please unmute yourself and state your name and you will have three minutes to speak. Hello, Commissioners. Megan Fitzpatrick speaking on behalf of Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee vehemently opposes legalizations of work installed without LPC permits. When property owners ignore the Landmark's law and make changes without the Commissioner's guidance and consent, all too frequently the results are at best unremarkable and at worst destructive. In either case, the practice of legalization, legalizing alterations after the fact, in essence, penalizes property owners who often go to great lengths to comply with Landmark's regulations by rewarding those who flout the law. The illegal work is not indicative of what the exterior of a Landmark building should look or feel like. What was once a continuous decorative iron railing is now a patchwork of utilitarian railing with unnecessarily decorative off-the-shelf trash units on diamond plates. 
This material palette is more indicative of a freight elevator than an 1890s flats building. The fences are disconnected from one another, not only physically, but also in design. We suggest the applicant restore their illegally removed railings to rectify this violation and urge the commission to reject this legalization. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, our next registered speaker is Christina Conroy with the Victorian Society of New York. Christina Conroy, I will be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself and state your name, and you will have three minutes to speak. Okay. Sorry, I have a new mouse that's not being cooperative. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society, New York. Now founded in New York City in 1966, the Victorian Society in America is dedicated to fostering the appreciation and preservation of our 19th and early 20th century heritage. The New York chapter promotes preservation of our historic districts, individual and scenic landmarks, interiors, and civic art. Now, this application seems to legalize the replacement without a permit of a metal fence along the side of a circa 1891 corner building. Now, part of the characteristic of row house blocks on the Upper West Side is the visual richness that historic decorative railings offer to pedestrians. The essential criteria for reviewing illegal work is whether it would have been appropriate in the first instance, and we do not believe the Commission would have found appropriate the complete removal of an elaborate historic cast and wrought iron fence for the purpose of installing trash containers. The remedy, therefore, must be replication of the original ironwork. And there are examples of extant articulated railings with 1890s motifs in the surrounding blocks, which the applicant could use as a model for replacement railing systems. Some of these appear to be exact duplicates of the removed fence. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you for your testimony. Um, that we also have a uh, raised hand from Historic Districts Council. I will be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask you to unmute yourself and state your name, and you have three minutes to speak. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC supports the proposed garbage enclosure because we find it to be a temporary fixture that does not damage the building itself. However, we do not support the applicant's removal of this building's decorative iron fence. We believe the applicant should incorporate or reinstall a decorative fence here and note they can look to reference photos contained in this presentation for examples of appropriately decorative ironwork. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, if anyone else on the Zoom would like to offer testimony, please use the raise hand function. All right, noting that no one else has raised their hand, uh, that concludes our testimony. Do we have a letter from the community board? Manhattan Community Board 7 recommends approval. All right. Uh, would you like to respond to the comments we've heard? Um, just for clarification, are we able to keep the dumpster and replace the railing to its original? Is that something that you would consider doing? Should the discussion go in that direction? All right. 
Thank you. All right, any final questions, commissioners? All right, let's, uh, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing's closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, and so this is a proposal to legalize the removal at, at some prior time of the historic fence that was at place in the time of designation um, and then the installation of these movable garbage enclosures. But in doing that, it limited the length of the area way fence and the area way fence that's before us now is a picket fence. So we have to comment on the placement and design of the fence. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you like to close this hearing? Yeah, so I think obviously one has to deal with trash. And so the trash storage is fine. However, I think the fence that installed is inappropriate and a new fence replicating the original fence should be installed. Okay. And I would approve it with that so you can work with staff to okay. resolve it. Great, thank you. Commissioner Chen? I'm in total agreement with Commissioner Ginsburg. Commissioner Lutfi? I concur. Okay. Does everybody, in the interest of time, everybody agrees? Okay. So we'll um, go ahead and make that motion with that recommendation. Thank Could you. we just get some clarity on the if the idea is that it actually extend in front of the garbage enclosures, or it's just the segment to the side well, of the garbage? I, I would say working with staff, ideally, it would extend in front of the garbage enclosure as gates that could be opened. But if that is either not possible for code reasons or others, at least all the fence that is there should be replaced to match. It is possible to go all the way. I, I don't think you just say that's what we want and, and right. a gate and yeah, not, have to not open give them two choices. To, the to roll the garbage enclosures out. And you could roll it out. There are many, there's many systems we can use to. Yeah, we can work with them on that. Okay. okay. With regards to LPC 24 03142, 420 Amsterdam Avenue, Upper West Side. Central Park West Historic District. A Romanesque revival style flat flats building with Renaissance revival style elements designed by Gilbert A. Schlesinger and built in 1890-91. Application is to legalize enclosing the area way, replacing the fence and installing a garbage enclosure without landmark preservation Com commission permits. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the covering of the below grade area way with metal plate while retaining the historic area way curb did not increase the footprint of the area way or damage or conceal any significant historic fabric. That the design material finish size and location of the black painted metal garbage enclosure is consistent with other garbage enclosures found in the area ways of buildings of this type and age in the historic district. And that the garbage enclosure does not extend beyond the footprint of the area way or higher than the fence and does not obscure or, or detract the significant architectural features of the building or staff. However, I find that the removal of the historic area way fence resulted in a loss of significant architectural features and the replacement fence does not recall the design of the historic fence. Therefore, I recommend that working with staff, the staff that the fence installed at the western portion, that, that the fence in, installed at the area way without LPC permit be replaced with a new fence matching or recalling the design of the historic fence. All right, and Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in, uh, sorry, John, <laughs> please call the vote. <laughs> I'll the question. That's your Carol. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. 
Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so please continue to work with the staff. Thank you. We'll move to the next public meeting item. And before I do that, I just want to note that there was a meeting item. It was formerly public meeting item number two that we did remove from the agenda today. Uh, that was LPC 24-01927, 107 Spring Street in Soho, Cast Iron Historic District. Uh, removed for today, we'll bring that back on an upcoming public meeting date. And that will take us to public meeting num item number four, LPC 24-05444. An application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 387, lot 55. 233 Wyckoff Street in the Borum Hill Historic District Extension. This is an Italian eight style row house built circa 1871 to 72. And the application is to construct a rear yard addition and to alter the front facade. Uh, this was last presented at the public hearing of February 27th, 2024. No action was taken at that time. Uh, the staff will present the vision to the proposal. Good morning, commissioners. Timothy Shaw, preservation staff. 233 Wyckoff Street is an Italian eight style row house built circa 1871 to 72 and is located on the north side of Wyckoff Street be between Bond and Nevin Streets in the Borm Hill Historic District Extension. Previously presented at the public hearing of February 27, 2024, as an application to construct a rear yard addition and to alter the front facade. At that meeting, the commissioners were not supportive of the installation of brownstone at the base of the front facade or with the use of thin brick at the rear facade of the house and at the new addition. And most commissioners had concerns with the size and depth of the rear yard addition within the context of the block, which was not sufficiently documented. In response, the architect has made the following changes. The proposed brownstone at the front facade has been eliminated from the proposal, and the historic brick at the basement level will remain as is. And the proposed thin brick at the top floor of the rear facade, this previous presentation here, uh, the proposed thin brick has been eliminated from the proposal as well. Um, the existing stucco coating that's at the top floor will remain and be patched as needed. The design of the rear yard addition has also been altered and more documentation of the block context has been provided as part of the presentation. The fenestration of the rear yard addition has essentially not changed. Um, and you can see here that previous proposal and the current. Uh, but again, um, standard brick will now be used instead of thin brick as the cladding at the rear. The setback at the, um, it's shown here, the setback at the rear yard addition, uh, the basement floor extended further and had a, a two planes. Uh, that has been eliminated. It's now just a single plane at the, at the basement floor. Um, the spiral stair, which was shown previously, has also been eliminated from the proposal. Uh, this new addition at the basement floor has been reduced in depth uh, from 18 feet 8.5 inches to 15 feet 6 inches. Um, the depth at the second floor, which was shallower um, than the basement floor, or it's confusing because it's a two-story addition, but this is the first floor of the house, uh, but it's the second floor of the addition, sorry. Um, that has actually increased by six inches, but that's to accommodate the full brick cladding. It is still uh, a, a fairly sh a shallower addition. Um, and then this can be seen again in the um, sections. This is the previous presentation. Um, the current, and it's actually best to look here. This is where the, the basement floor at the, there were two planes. This is the fullest depth and um, So this is the fullest depth, and then it's reduced in depth at the basement floor by uh, approximately three feet. Um, the block plan has also been updated with the depths of other additions added in as best could be determined. While the majority of additions are still shallower than, than the 15 and, a half, 15 and a half feet that is proposed at the basement level of 233 Wyckoff, there are a number of additions that are shown as uh, 10 feet deep at least 10 feet deep, and six additions that are shown that are at least 16 feet deep. Uh, regarding the height of the 48 additions within the block, there are nine that are at least two stories tall. They have also included uh, more context photos of the block interior with views from their roof. Um, this is looking east towards Bond, excuse me, towards Nevins, and um, looking uh, west 
here towards Bond Street. Um, there are also some views of other multi-story additions on the Bergen Street side of the block and some aerial views showing some of the larger additions within the block. Um, additionally, note that a very tall and deep uh, apartment building at the end of the block, end of their side of the block on Wyckoff was built uh, shortly before designation and a large full height addition was built uh, at 165 Bond Street on the end, um, or excuse me, 163 Bond Street, uh, oops, pardon me, 165 built before designation. Um, we also, uh, commission uh, did approve a large addition at 163 Bond Street with a, um, a, a deep two-story two extension uh, in 2021. That has uh, not been constructed, um, but the commission also did approve a two, actually a three-story addition uh, 206A Bergen Street in 2019, and that has been constructed, that's shown here. Um, we also have a few pages from that 2019 presentation just to sh that give a better sense of the context of Wyckoff Street. Um, this is the rear facade, the rear yard, uh, rear facades of the Wyckoff Street. That's that um, apartment building that was built prior to designation and the large extension on Bond that was built prior to designation and showing some of the larger additions, uh, the, some of the multi-story additions that are on Bond, uh, I mean, on Bergen Street. And this is, again, the, um, this is the approved section uh, of 206A Bergen Street, which was approved in 2019, which also shows a deeper cellar level with uh, setback levels above. Um, and this is, again, just uh, the elevation of that approved extension from that presentation and some more context. The architect uh, and owner are here if there are any questions about the design uh, decisions. Thank you very much, Tim. Are there any questions? Okay, um, I think we can move right to our discussion. So thank you, Tim, for such a clear presentation. Um, the last time we saw this application, as Tim said, the commissioners, you all were unanimous in your feelings about the front and so the proposed stucco that uh, they presented last time is now eliminated from the proposal and we're only looking at the rear yard addition. Um, at the time we saw the rear yard addition, we did ask that they reduce the depth of the rear, that, that two stories could be okay if they reduce the depth of the addition and um, they have reduced the depth of the ground floor of the addition. We also asked them to, uh, cons I think there was uh, one comment about the benefits of thin brick, but most commissioners asked that the top floor be brick and stucco be retained and that the thin brick not be used there. And so um, we'll, and they have also today provided this additional context to show that there are other additions that are deeper than this addition and other additions and new buildings that have um, deeper and taller, uh, taller masses and uh, deeper footprints. So we'll begin our discussion. I think um, Commissioner Master, I think you were actually comfortable with it last time given the size of the yards. So um, with this reduction and you specifically asked them to keep the top floor intact. So with this reduction, are you comfortable still? Yes, I think the um, it's a big improvement and I think it's appropriate. Great, thank you. And Commissioner Lutfi? Excuse me. Yeah, I think the, uh, I agree. I think the changes uh, are very positive and I could support this. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Likewise, yeah, I, I think the uh, applicant has really made the uh, um, improvements to the, based on the, the, the comments from last time. Okay, Commissioner Ginsburg. Uh, agree with my fellow commissioners approval. Okay, Com uh, Commissioner Goldblum. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, they. I think all the changes they made were uh, to, to, to improve the project, and um, I think, although there are very few, um, like for extensions, their additional research is 
helpful in reflecting that they're, you know, the context seems, I think it, I think it, I can judge it appropriate here. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Appropriate. Okay, all right, so I think we do have enough um, to support this today, and I do want to thank you for providing that additional context. I think that was helpful to understand the size and depth of the other buildings and additions in the block. Uh, Commissioner Master, would you make the motion? Sure. In the matter of LPC-24-0544, 233 Wyckoff Street, Forum Hill Historic District Extension, an Italianate-style row house built circa 1871-72, application is to construct a rear yard addition and to alter the front facade. I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Borum Hill Historic District Extension. I recommend approval, finding that the proposed work at the rear facade will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features, that the rear yard addition will not be visible from any public thoroughfare, that other rear yard additions with a similar height and depth exist within the block, and that the proposed two-story rear yard addition, for which the second story will be substantially set back from the first story, will be modest in scale and will not overwhelm the building, adjacent buildings, or the block's central green space. That the rear yard addition will not rise to the full height of the building, thereby preserving a sense of the building's original form and fenestration as part of a row. And that the proposed materials and design of the rear yard addition, featuring brick cladding and multi-light windows, and doors and punched masonry openings will be in keeping with the character of rear facades found within the block and historic district. Right, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. John, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Seven in favor, one opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved. Thank you. And we move to the next, uh, we'll move to our public hearing agenda. We'll start with public hearing item number one, LPC 24-07178. This is an application for an advisory report. It's in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1117, lot one, Prospect Park Scenic Landmark, a primarily naturalistic style park designed by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Box and built in 1866 to 1873. The application is to modify pathways and landscaping and install paving, bridges, and walkways. Good afternoon. My name is Lillian Liu. I am the Assistant Landscape Architect with Prospect Park Alliance. And today we are presenting the master plan for the Prospect Park Lakeshore Restoration Project as well as the schematic plan for Phase 1. Phase 1 is funded by Brooklyn Delegation and Mayor Fairfax. The master plan runs from Wellhouse Drive on the north to the west side of the lake and around the south side of the lake and ends where it says uh, phase one. Uh, PPA engaged in two community hearings and these are the following, um, and we heard the following concerns, including reduction in flooding in their neighborhood, improving ADA access, and enhancing wildlife habitat. Our goals are to restore the, sh the shoreline to Olmstead and Box's original dining car, while factoring in methods to reduce the amount of stormwater from leaving the park 
and improving city life accessibility and supporting wildlife is improved transit. is the 1874 Olmstead and Voss, no? <laughs> this is the 1874 Olmstead and Voss Historic Plan, which was the final plan that we submitted for the park. The plan shows that the shoreline has more inlets, more islands, and peninsulas, um, which were more irregularly shaped. The plan also shows the refectory, which is shown in the middle top part of the plan. Um, and that was going to be a large building overlooking the water, but it was never built. The plans above show the park throughout the years. The 1866 plan on the left was the first plan that showed the lake. The 1874 plan um, refined the boundaries of the shoreline and island. And the 1888 plan shows the constructed lake. Uh, the orange outline um, indicates the refectory that wasn't built, and Wellhouse Drive, as indicated by the yellow line, was, in, was installed where the refectory would have been. Then moving on to the 1900s, the shallower areas of the lake were filled, the islands were consolidated into the mainland, and the shorelines were reinforced with concrete and paddle rock. And these images show the history the shoreline edges with plantings and boulders. And here we see uh, historic images of the shoreline with the retaining walls put in around 1926 and 1927. And there were several historic bridges within Prospect Park that were composed of wood decking and railings. And in the early 2000s, there were three viewing platforms that were installed with CDC and LTC approval. Around the lake, we generally see missing and inaccessible pavement, uh, desire lines, which are dirt paths that are caused by people who aren't taking the existing um, path system, erosion due to foot traffic and flooding, and phragmites, which is an invasive plant that takes over the water, and broken retaining walls. And this is Wellhouse Drive that has a lot of impervious surfaces. Uh, we categorized the following design strategies to help meet our goals. We will see these colors in the upcoming plan. Uh, in general, the existing path and bridle paths will be repaved in kind. There will be a blue line that will show the shoreline changes over time. The restoration will be represented in purple to indicate the reconstruction of missing features from the Olmstead period. And we'll also be reinterpreting some features which will be indicated by orange. And these are reconstruction of missing Olmstead features, but they are modified and adapted to meet current conditions. And then we'll also have new elements in pink, um, and they are but they represent Olmstead and Vox's original design. And now we come to our master plan for the lake, and we'll zoom into each area in a moment. The lake had four original rustic shelters. The, this peninsula that we're looking at will be our phase one. And in this area, number one is a waterfront access point, and two and three represent rustic shelters. The photo for two is a rustic shelter that no longer exists. And um, the second photo on the bottom right is a rustic shelter called the Summer House. It was rebuilt in 1997, and it still remains. Now, looking at the same 1874 plan on the left, we see the original inlets on the east and west side of the peninsula. The paths terminate um, on the shoreline access point and a rustic shelter. And then in the center, you'll see the existing plan that shows the inlets have been filled and many of the historic paths and rustic shelters no longer exist. So in our proposed 
plan uh, for phase one on the right, we are proposing to put back the waterfront access point and a seating area where the rest of Parker would have been and bringing an inlet on either side of the peninsula, similar to uh, Olmstead Plan to increase stormwater storage capacity. We are also proposing a timber bridge um, over the inlet for a continuous path. And we'll also be adding a wetland on the southwest side of the path to collect stormwater runoff. This is a rendering of the first of the two waterfront access points. We are proposing granite slabs and central park settees, similar to uh, what was installed at Dock Beach, which is another area in the park. The granite element was a historical element that was used as the foundation under shelters. This is a rendering of the second waterfront access point. And here we plan to restore the historic path with Central Park Cities and also open up the views so that people can access the water. This is an uh, this is a view of our um, proposed inlet. Uh, the invasive plant uh, called Phragmites will be removed, and it'll open up to a view of the summer house in the distance. And the inlet will be able to store more water. And since we anticipate that there will be flooding, we propose the timber bridge uh, over that inlet for uninterrupted circulation. The shoreline edge becomes planted with wetland plants to promote a more diverse habitat and to reduce erosion. And now we're going to look at the Three Sisters East area. Um, we're out of the phase one area, so we'll be looking at the rest of the master plan. Uh, the historic plan on the left shows that there is a path that terminates uh, to the inlet. Um, however, currently there is a part of the inlet that's filled and has existing trees. So we are extending the path from phase one to the main pedestrian path. And then also historically, there was a point where three distinct paths converged. And that connection point is missing in the current conditions. So we are proposing a path that connects the asphalt path, the bridle path, and East Drive. And we're also continuing the shoreline restoration. <coughs> and in this rendering, you'll see the restored shoreline. And now we'll be looking at Three Sisters Island West. The historic plan shows that there was a formal connection between current day peristyle to Three Sisters Island. The peristyle, um, which is on the bottom middle part of the page, is a Grecian shelter with Corinthian columns that was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1972. Um, and then we don't have any photos of the Paris by Three Sisters Island, but the plan, the historic plan, um, looks like it, it could have been a terrace. And in the 1871 letter from Olmstead to the Brooklyn Park Commissioners, um, he said that there, that the walk shall be spread laterally to the beaches or bays of the lake, and there will be an outlet from it upon a boat landing. So therefore, we are restoring a formal uh, waterfront which was lost over time and taking the geometry of Olmstead's plan. We are also connecting the terrace with paths to East Drive to the peristyle and framed by a planting buffer, which we'll talk about shortly. And we're also um, proposing to increase the size of Three Sisters Island, uh, which has eroded over time. And um, we ho are hoping to bring it back to its historic precedent. This rendering shows the proposed blue stone terrace. Whoops, that through the water. There's a hex block pavement that will create a transition from the blue stone to the asphalt and formalizes this waterfront directly opposite the peristyle. Our next area is East Drive. 
historic, historically Olmstead proposed trees that broke up pavement between the carriage path and the bridle path. The image on the bottom shows that there was a row of trees uh, separating different lanes of transportation, which um, converged onto the main road again. And we would like to apply this design approach within East Drive. Since the lake experienced the significant flooding that has negatively affected the surrounding streets along Parkside Avenue, just outside of the park, we are exploring to separate the inner existing pedestrian lane using Olmstead's approach of planting within pavement to capture storm water. Um, this approach also pays homage to Olmstead's intent, intent of having pedestrians walk separately from um, vehicular traffic, as well as reducing storm water, which would negatively impact neighboring homes. And this is a, a section of East Drive. We are um, proposing to add a 10 foot planting buffer within the existing 55 foot lane. Um, this separates the pedestrians from vehicular and bike lanes, as well as being able to capture storm water. And then our next area is the uh, Hammerhead Island or the Hammerhead Peninsula. Olmstead's original plan showed that the inlet on the east and west side um, really cut into um, the peninsula. Um, the existing plan shows that the historic paths were missing and that um, the inlets were filled. And we are proposing the inlets uh, to increase the capacity for stormwater on either side of the hammer, similar to Olmstead's plan on the left. We are also putting back the historic path and proposing a timber walk over the areas we anticipate to flood. And we're also proposing boulders alongside the boardwalk for habitat. This is a rendering of the proposed inlet. We are proposing water to be shallowly brought in under the timber path, which connects to the paved path in the distance. And now we're going to focus on West Island, which is an area that often floods. We are creating an ephemeral wetland to store stormwater runoff. The, there will be a boardwalk that allows um, ADA access over this wetland. And we'll also restore the eroded West Island to uh, its historic precedent. And we'll also be adding a, a, a path access. Um, from Park Circle. And then this is a rendering of the timber path that goes over the wetland. And the next area that we'll be looking at will be the northwest area. Starting with the southwest waterfront access point, we are creating an accessible pathway to the existing rustic shelter. And then on the northwest access point, we're adding an ADA ac ac accessible uh, waterfront access point that takes the same geometry as the historic one. Um, this is a rendering of the southwest waterfront access point. Um, the existing rustic shelter currently is, compact is surrounded by compacted soils and there's no path to it. So we're proposing a paved path that leads to the structure. And the rustic structure will also be surrounded by granite pavement. And there will be seeding, uh, Central Park seed peas at the water's edge, and a shoreline will be planted and retained by boulders. This is the Northwest waterfront by Wellhouse Drive. And it also currently has compacted soils and limited seeding. So we are proposing a larger viewing area paved with blue stone with additional seating and we'll also replant the shoreline. And now we come to the last part of the master plan, which is Wellhouse Drive. Uh, 
Um, so Drive is not original to Olmstead's plan. Um, it was approximately 50, or it is approximately 55 feet wide, and it was installed around 1888 for vehicles. Um, the wall was mostly installed around the same time to retain the soil, soil for that drive. And now that the vehicles are no longer um, allowed in the park, we are proposing to reduce that 55 foot drive down to 20 feet. And then we are also planning to extend the woodland on either side of that drive. This is a, the proposed view of the drive with the reduced We are proposing to use uh, materials that are already found in the park. Uh, the new material will be the cellular concrete system, which is on the bottom right. And we're proposing that for the maintenance boat launch. Um, we feel that that would be sturdy enough for the boat, but also allow plants to grow in between the concrete so that the plants will blend in with the rest of the garden. And then we are also planning to use standard type furnishings already found in the park. And then we come to our last slide. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have questions? Yes, Commissioner Chen. In your earlier presentation, there were a number um, of uh, wooden bridges. Uh, how many of those are still left? Of the original yes. bridges? Um, Pretty much all of them, except for Ford Bridge and one other bridge. Um, Reason for asking, I didn't see during the presentation any restoration of those bridges. Oh, the, oh, those bridges. So Ford Bridge no longer exists, um, and these bridges are outside of our design area, but they're in other parts of our park. And I think this sh uh, slide was shown because you are proposing some wood Correct. bridges to show that fits in. Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I see this as a restoration historic project, and I go to page 30, um, uh, slide 30, and, and you have a diagram that says, you know, proposed plan, what the colors are and all that. And you have a new extended inlet. Is that new or that's existing or that's interpretive? Or where does it fit into the, mm -hmm. the historic picture? Because mm -hmm. I, there's no way for me to tell the difference here, what's historic and what is new. The inlet on the left, uh, the image on the left is the historic. So. Uh, we outlined in blue what that uh, edge historically looked like. Um, and it's been filled in over time. So in the center, you see that it's... I think the blue line is a oh, oh, washed okay. out and hard to read. So just if you use your, use the, uh, or there's a, yeah, that oh, one. Oh, I see. You can point to the water's edge. Okay, good. So there's this line. That's the edge. Okay. There's this line, which is uh, the edge of the shoreline historically. And then this is what we have today. You, as you can see, there was some land um, that were filled in over time. So that inlet is doesn't go in as much as it did. Um, and over time, there's plants that have been grown in there. Um, and so what we are trying to do is try to bring those inlets back, but we can only do it around where there aren't any existing trees. Sure. So we are trying to mimic um, the elements that were historic 
as best as we can. Um, but we can, we can do it as best as we can around the existing trees. So, so that's re that's reinterp re reinterp reinterpretive, right? Okay. That's where it should have been marked, say, reinterpreted. Because oh, we, you're yeah, reinterpreting okay. something that, so it's not clear in your diagrams. So I get confused about what's really in, reinterpretive, what's really existing, what's historical. And I'm just, I mean, I understand some of it, but there are a couple of them like that. And I'm wondering, um, uh, that's one. The other one is, is, is uh, this notion of material. Um, what new materials are you putting into the park that doesn't go back to the historic material? What new material? I think I see one or two, but mm -hmm. uh, like, like I think the timber path. I've never seen one. Are there in Central Park timber path? Timber path. Timber path. Timber. Oh yes, yes. That's what, that's what we have. That's what we have in the bridges that in our park right now. So in that park, they have mm -hmm. that was existing, but mm -hmm. historic. Mm -hmm. The image that you're looking at on the bottom right that is Falls Hill Bridge in our park. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, Commissioner Chapin, followed by Commissioner Goldwyn. <clears throat> yeah, uh, page forty. Um, so you are removing uh, most of the this historic wall, which is a 19th century wall. It's been there a long time. Is, is, is there some way we can preserve that uh, as part of your design, or you want to narrow the path? We do want to narrow the path. Um, one of the ideas was to remove the path so that we can bring the existing woodline, woodland on the north side of the wall down. Um, but it's also if, but we could also shift <laughs> uh, the path on the other side and and keep that wall if, if that's desired. And you um, could you just comment a little on your tree uh, the tree plan? That's sure. You, uh, you, I saw it get included on one of the pages, but you made an intention. Oh yeah. I, I don't know, it was a comment in staff notes that some of the trees were not being installed in kind of, let's say, a naturalistic pattern, but more like in a way or something along the East Drive. Oh, know. yes. Um, I, I see what you're saying. So this is... Oh. Let me you, there's this, there's this, there's this area that mm -hmm. we're proposing to put the trees in a straight line. Um, I can go back to that page if it works. Right there. So this is, I believe you were referring to this row of trees uh, up here, uh, which would be uh, the, the, the island there. So, <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm called it that. so when we came up with this concept, this was what the road looked like. And we were planning on putting the trees in this uh, white striping here. So it was an area that, um, Bikers and vehicles weren't weren't it's supposed to be on there anyway. To divide the pedestrian from right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we were looking to use this area to put the plants in, plants in, and that way we can separate. We can keep a, a lane for uh, pedestrians and separate from the vehicles and bicycles and. Um, since it's paved, we, we figured we could put plants in there and help absorb some water. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Commissioner Goldblum. <coughs> Uh, I believe it was drawn to indicate that it was supposed to be naturalistic. Um, it was installed probably to a degree <coughs> of, of that na with that naturalistic edge. Um, there. But the idea was that there was supposed that there were there were plants that were going to grow. Um, Mm. Yeah, it it was supposed. Yes, it was. It, it was supposed to be more regular, so it looked more natural. And then also, the plant would end up growing um, and filling it in. So I think part of that drawing was also to to draw the edge of the plant line, which would naturally be um, kind of wave, wavy as the way you've seen it. And it, it, it and then over time, it, it, it did get flatter. It did, did get straighter because of the fall. All right, other questions? Yes, Commissioner Lutfi. When you reduce the width um, of that roadway, what, what is it going to be? Oh, East Drive. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Wellhouse Drive. Yeah, Wellhouse. It's currently about 55 feet wide. That's including the sidewalk. We are looking to bring it down to 20 feet wide, and that is um, wide enough for a mixed use for bikers, joggers, uh, pedestrians, and also some maintenance vehicles. Is that the width that, is that the size of the road mostly around the park or is that less, the 20 feet? Oh, around the loop, it's mm -hmm. it's wider. Mm -hmm. It's about 55. But this is off the loop. This is off the loop. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And the loop around the dry, the, the loop around within the park is a historic, it's historic on the Olmstead plan and this drive was is is a circle was not on the own plan mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I, i'm not really uh i defer to your to others expertise on this the whole way where you're creating like wetlands um so what happens there when it rains mm -hmm. when it rains um well, when it's when it doesn't rain, it's dry, um, so it's grass or it's it's wetland with plants, so it'll be dry. And then when it rains, it'll collect the stormwater and it'll be uh, be an area that just holds the stormwater. And then after a couple of days, it'll slowly recede into the ground. Um, in the inlets, um, it'll it won't the water won't be full all the time and so when it rains those inlets will be full and i'll store the water until um until it slowly reduces mm -hmm. and so where it isn't in i mean the inlets there's already water right there. right so where it's not in the inlets and there's still water you know it's just still water so what might the implication be, you know, especially in like a, the summer where it's hot and humid and for like uh, mosquitoes mm -hmm. breeding there? What, what do you, were you, have you checked into that? Do you know? I don't, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Um, we are planning on putting in habitat for dragonflies that like to eat mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And we are also, uh, we will also be planning for the water to to circulate. 
and in the wetland areas where the water will be stored, it'll drain within uh, like within one one to three three days. So it wouldn't be around too long for the mosquitoes to come back. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, yes, Commissioner Jefferson. Was that a natural lake that was always there, like 150 years ago? No, it's an artificial lake. Ah, oh, okay. All right, other questions? All right, let's see if we have public testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and is there anyone in the room who'd like to speak on this? Not on this item. Okay, so we'll turn it over to Stephen Thompson to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Uh, I will note that the Brooklyn Borough Board recommends approval. Um, we have one previously registered remote participant, Christina Conroy with Victorian Society of New York. Uh, Christina, I will promote you to panelist, after which uh, we ask you to unmute yourself, state your name, and you will have three minutes to speak. Good, af good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society in New York. Now, the Prospect Park Lakeshore has been abused and neglected for more than 100 years. The overall proposal for restoration is laudable. The most welcome and important part of the proposal is the restoration of the soft, naturalistic lake edge. The historic shoreline was originally had many uh, islands, inlets, small hooks, and peninsulas. The proposed restorations go in the right direction, but we encourage a bolder approach to the restoration of the shoreline's complex historic form. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Here are some details from the various phases that we can see that we can improve. Um, the wood boardwalks are something that might be found in a modern day nature preserve and they should be eliminated except where used as the walking surface for rustic bridges. The small wood bridges are typical rustic features of the park, but we think it would be more appropriate to replace missing original rustic structures instead of building new ones. Reintroducing planted mediums to the drive where they existed originally is a great restoric idea, uh, but it, uh, it can help separate pedestrians and cycles and occasional vehicles that jointly use the drive, but these medians should be planted with large canopy trees as they were originally and not smaller ornamentals. Olmsted parks are known for their intuitive and, and innovative design for the separation of traffic. Each user, pedestrians, equestrians, and vehicles had its own separate and distinct system of walks, bridle trails, and drives. In a few locations, pedestrian paths are shown to merge with the bridle path and drive. As a practical manner, these intersections may be required, but the distinct design details of these three types of circulation should be maintained. The Wellhouse Drive isn't an original feature, so there's some flexibility in its redesign, but the design should be based on historic precedents. We fear that the proposed design will either look like an overscaled pedestrian walk or an undersized vehicular drive. Finally, this large project is an opportunity to revisit some standard details that are inappropriate to the historic park. Now these include concrete curbs, black asphalt pavement, modern bottle filling stations, and the recently installed obtrusive park department signs. These signs have quickly become magnets for graffiti, as we predicted. Now that vehicle use is mainly prohibited, the drives and their edges can be redesigned to restore their rustic character. Thank you, commissioners. 
Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, I see that we also have a raised hand from Historic Districts Council. I'll be promoting you to panelists. Uh, please unmute yourself and state your name and you will have three minutes to speak. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. In general, HDC finds this project both appropriate and laudable. The restoration of the lakeshore and the softening of its edges is necessary and welcome. In fact, we urge the Alliance to take this approach even further and to restore the historic variations in the lakeshore, including islands and inlets envisioned by Olmsted and Volks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, if anyone else participating in the Zoom would like to offer testimony, please use the raise hand function. All right, noting that no one else has uh, indicated that they would like to offer testimony, that concludes our uh, public testimony portion. Thank you, Stephen. Would you like to respond to the comments we've heard? Commissioners, any final questions? If not, then we'll move to our discussion. Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion um, for these changes, um, really that is I think in the spirit of a restoration of uh, the, the uh, Lake Shore Drive around um, the lakeshore restoration around this lake in the southeastern portion of the park. Um, and there have, they are, as we've discussed, reconfiguring the shoreline um, to bring back some inlets, um, around avoiding trees, uh, so not bringing back the exact configuration, uh, but trying to restore some of that spirit, installing new paths, new uh, bridges, and um, reducing the amount of um, paving in the vehicular drives to include uh, pedestrian paths and separation. So um, we'll begin our discussion by uh, Commissioner Chapin. Like to close Thank the you, time. Sarah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think in general uh, that this is uh, going very much in the right direction, the restoration of the edge, uh, softening and Providing assess assess accessibility, obviously, is very important. Uh, and, you know, that requires some additional paving. And, but they're also providing some um, places which are just generally accessible for everyone who have not been, uh, that are going back to uh, the original plan where you can get a, a nicer view of the lake and so forth. So, and, you know, uh, trying to deal with the desire lines is always something that, you know, you kind of have to do in a park because otherwise people will go where they want to go. So, you know, and use changes and how people circulate changes. So I, I think all of that's fine and that they're not really increasing the paving. Um, and I think that the tree plan generally uh, seems fine to me. I, the suggestion about using larger canopy trees is something you know they could look at and might be might be for that level of division of it and I'll call it. Um, I'm actually I I do have a concern about um, taking out the uh, that a uh, wall that's been there since before 1900. Uh, it seems to me that. There must be some way to reduce the um, pathway there without uh, eliminating all of the wall. Maybe there's some section or side. Or I, I couldn't tell if it's on both sides there, actually. I mean, it's a retaining wall, so it seems like it wouldn't be. But it's, and I'm unfortunately, I'm not just familiar with this particular section. But anyway, uh, I'm not really comfortable with, with seeing them take out this wall that's been there which looks like it's generally in pretty good condition. And otherwise, uh, I think, you know, I, I'm okay. supportive of the plan. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum?
Thank you, Commissioner Ginsburg. Um, I agree with the other commissioners. This is a wonderful plan. Uh, I realize, first of all, you've got community input and balancing a number of different issues. Uh, I, I'm, I don't feel strongly about the stone wall, but if the other commissioners, I have no problem with. I think it's good to keep it. And in general, thank you. Really nice job. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more. I think that I have to commend the applicant for a very, very clear, um, exciting project. I think is, uh, you know, if only every project could be this well described, you know, now is uh, the Three Sister Island, the Hammerhead are all doing their heads. Um, and uh, I just thought this is a wonderful to restore um, the, uh, the Frederick Olmsted uh, original plan, the access, the uh, avoiding the flood, uh, flooding, the wetland, uh, well done, very well done. Thank you, Commissioner Lutfi. I didn't hear everybody else, but I'm just guessing that everyone has been overall very positive. This is, I'm in the park all the time and walk around so, um, and do whatever. But I, I think this is, it's amazing that you're doing this restorative work. And I, I know it's going to take 10 years, but, uh, and I hope I'm still like walking around the park, <laughs> but uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I want to commend you for your hard work and attention to detail and, and also a great presentation. Thank you. Great. Commissioner Master. Yeah, I want to echo um, all the other commissioners' um, positive uh, feedback of this plan. Um, I think that stormwater management is so incredibly important, and I think you've done a really wonderful job in um, introducing elements such as the wetlands and, you know, other types of things. Um, I know that the trees, um, I actually think that they, I, I like them. I think they add more greenery. And I think it also helps you in um, the stormwater management as well. Um, I echo uh, Commissioner Chapin's concern about uh, retaining uh, the stone wall if, if we can. Um, other than that, I think it's a great plan. Okay. Um, and Commissioner Jones. I start off, I agree with the stone wall. I think this is an incredible proposal, a schematic that's really Amazing in the sense that you know this is a hundred and what is it like a hundred and fifty year old park and and but and I think it's beautifully done. the The only issue I have is the the what I'm interested in is in, in the interpretation parts. You know how are they interpreting it now and how they're coming up with these new things and they they just went over those right. I mean that's the creative part for them and. Mm -hmm. they didn't, they didn't it Thank you. All right, so I think um, we will make a motion to support it and recommend that they look at in, uh, retaining and incorporating the stone wall. Okay. <laughs> in the matter of an advisory report for a book on LPC 2407178, the Prospect Park Scenic Landmark, a primarily naturalistic style park designed by Frederick Wall Olmsted and Calvert Wall and built in 1866 to 1873. Application is to modify pathways and landscaping and install paving, bridges, and walkways. I recommend that a, that a favorable report be issued uh, with suggested modifications, finding that the work will be largely restorative, eliminating modern intrusion at the water's edge and returning the landscape closer to the original design intent, that the modifications to the pathway system and limited expansion of paving in select areas will uh, improve barrier-free access and enhance the visitor's experience by increasing public access to the waterfront that the limited non-restorative changes to the footprint of the shoreline and placement of new pathways will improve circulation, support the protection of ecologically sensitive areas, 
and be uh, harmonious with the historic design. With the pathways, walkway, bridges, steps, and granite slabs will be simply designed and in keeping with the types of features found within the park in terms of their siting, scale, materials, and finishes. With the boat access ramp will be modest in size and screened by vegetation and will help provide access for maintenance work. With the removal of a portion of paving and creation of a linear planting bed within a portion of the East Drive, providing pedestrian only and mixed use traffic will help improve safety and drainage. With the narrowing of the late 19th century Wellhouse Drive, we'll return landscaping to the section of the park while maintaining a drive width compatible with its adjoining pathways. With the proposed benches, uh, lampposts, bike racks, uh, garbage enclosures, and pipe rails will be typical of furnishings used th throughout the park in terms of materials, design, details, and finishes. With the proposed work will not result in the loss of any mature trees or obstruct any prominent vistas. And with the establishment of a master plan to perform the work in phases over 10 years will help support a cohesive design and provide sufficient time for a construction project of this scale. However, I find that the uh, removal of the 19th century stone wall adjacent to Wellhouse Drive will eliminate a historic feature and detract from the informal composition of these walls within this section uh, of the park. Therefore, I recommend that if possible, the 19th century wall on Wellhouse Drive be retained. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Thanks. And John, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Eight in favor, none opposed. The motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we'll continue to work with the staff as you develop your design and move towards a perfect design commission. Okay. So we are going to now conclude for lunch. It is uh, almost 1230. We'll resume at 1 o'clock. Um, we'll come back with item number, public hearing item number two. And we'll all ask all um, members of the public to exit the hearing room at this time and all members of the public to exit the Zoom meeting at this time. Um, should you wish to return this afternoon in the Zoom, um, you will have technical difficulties if we have to remove you. So just voluntarily exit the meeting and re-enter the meeting at 1 o'clock. And we'll uh, see everybody then. Thanks. <laughs>